heavy is, is a stamp of approval in terms of a musical you know, quality and identity and lifestyle. You're going to take a tour of my bus right now. Just follow me along. I'll show you where we live, sleep and breathe while we're bringing you the tour of 34 days over the next two months. You always put your head to the back, feet to the front. Hopefully electronic guys will figure out, for the married guys on the tour, you don't know about the back lounge. The Delta Heavy Tour has reached about 80, 85,000 people. I've always been fascinated by the electronic music world, that they've never been able to figure out how to tour. Delta Heavy is sort of peak heavy within a set, so if you're there for four hours, you might have sort of these Delta Heavy moments within the night, you know, and it's also dealt as a brainwave. Touring is about a sense of humor, and that's how I've done it for 20 years. So they just need to continue to have a sense of humor every day, because it's not going to be perfect. Their lives are not going to be perfect. Their show's going to be perfect. That's the difference. Whether you're Bono or the Rolling Stones, you give up a little personal sacrifice, so your audience sees a perfect show every day. Golden Bullies don't shit on the bus. On the street bus. <laughs> Matt Malice, tour manager. AJ Seaback, Lasers. Pat Tetrick, audio and backline. Matt Clutie, your audio technician. Brent Spears, set designer. Brett Gross, lighting. Hobie Dykus, audio. Kenny Leith, stage manager. Matt Crossman, lighting. Steve Gordon, video. Michael David, LD. Johnny Jacam, VJ. Paul Elliott, bus driver. Al Kerstetter, truck driver. Tim Skinner, road manager. Jimmy Van Am. John Digweed. And I'm Sasha. Just got off a uh, nine hour flight from London arriving in Miami for our first gig on this uh, mammoth tour that we've taken on. These boys, in the next six weeks, I don't think they've got a clue what they're letting themselves in for. And uh, by the end of it, I'm not even sure I'll recognize them. Well, building. Pretty large. Everybody's <laughs> That's fucking wicked. Yeah, right? Come on. Yes, no? Hang on, let's ask this security guard up here. Who are you looking for? Uh, we've got an event on tomorrow night. They're setting up the, the sound. In here in the arena? Yeah, in the arena. It's got one of those clip on ponytails, man. <laughs> this arena is pretty amazing. I mean, I've done some big shows, but. You're in the wrong building, you gotta go to Miami Arena. This is the arena, isn't it? Oh, we're at no, the wrong building. A you got the Miami <laughs> Arena over there. It might be. Ages. Wrong. Come out. <laughs> Come out. Where's the Miami Arena? See that, um, that round building big, big over there? Building over there? Yeah. That's where you're going. Which okay. way? Good start. <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> it. It's amazing. We're now running a 24-hour phone service. The bets are on already. When's the call going to come? We want separate buses. <laughs> so that was the arena we thought we were playing in, which looks a bit big and scary. But this is the one we're playing in, which still looks fairly big. Ant and Deck, watch out. We're playing here tomorrow night. What's your name? Sasha, John Digweed. Hi, I'm Mr. Sasha and Pigweed at the North Lobby and also a gentleman with the camera. Did she say Sasha and Pigweed? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they've been in here since 7 o'clock this morning, so uh, we're going to see how far they've got. But I uh, just spoke to Jimmy, he said the sound's amazing. So this is our first view of what uh, we can expect tomorrow night. What do you think of the junk is it? <laughs> Looks <laughs> fucking amazing, man. Dude, it is going to be fucking cool. Do you guys want this flat or do you, you know it, it rotates up and down? That was the only big question. Uh, Jimmy thought it was okay up. We didn't unlock it, but it can. Can drop down a little. It goes on the hinges and stuff. I like it at the angle. Steve, he likes it at the angle. It's so, so it's just a constant feed. Yeah. So you can't, you can't send an effect just of one deck at a time. I keep asking about that, but no. No. <laughs> Move that. Shift that around. Yeah, did you ask for the red and jelly, jelly beans and all that stuff yet? Uh, uh, blue, only blue M&M's. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of weird seeing it with all the lights on and stuff. Um, but I'm sure once we've uh, once it's blacked out and we've got our visuals going, it's going to be quite impressive when you walk into this for the first time. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about it, but I think you know, whenever John and I play together, always some magic happens. So <laughs> I think it'll be cool. Sasha, Sasha will survive, and John. I don't know. I don't. Let's go, guys. Unbelievable. 
down to Happy Toe is huge leap forward to you know take electronic music to, to in America to a different level. It's quarter to one, Sashi's not here, hopefully he's going to make a sort of appearance later on, so we'll see how he gets on. He's probably saving himself for tomorrow night, which is really important. I saw the opportunity, this place coming along, and uh, just really wanted to get involved. Uh, we found it was coming up for, for sale, and I offered to put a little bit of money in, and uh, yeah, it's just good to have this kind of little bit of involvement side of DJing and playing music. Yeah. So I'm going to go and hang out and get drunk when I come over to it. Welcome to my hotel room. It's uh, Mandarin Oriental, downtown Miami. As you can see, set up, decks ready to go. G4 laptop for uh, getting all my emails from back home and a healthy supply of Baraka. It doesn't really feel like Miami here, actually. Like normally, you know, you get to Miami and stay on South Beach, and there's such a vibe down there. Um, we kind of decided to stay out of a uh, out of trouble this year. I thought Sasha might come down last night to uh, check out the bar and everything, but he's, you know, he's been getting his stuff ready for tonight. So uh, it's kind of quite a good thing, you know, let him pace himself a little bit. Sometimes when he goes out the night before, he can tend to go missing for a few days. So I found some amazing music today. Um, loads of stuff I've had cut onto acetate. All these ones in the blue covers on my acetates. I must have spent about three grand on uh, acetates in preparation for this tour. It's two months that we're away for, so when you kind of take that into account, it's like, wow, this is such a long time to be away, but the amount of gigs we got and press and everything else set up within the next eight weeks, I think it's gonna fly by. Now, this is the console we're actually gonna be using on the tour. I, need, I needed some decks to go through my music, and the next minute they turned up with this thing, I thought they were gonna <laughs> bring me one record deck and a little speaker, and they bought me a, a whole setup. so it's quite impressive to look at, I guess. <laughs> I haven't DJed for so long, it is going to be like throwing myself back in the deep end again. I mean, we've, you know, we've got a webcast tonight on AOL, four hours, we're going out live on Radio 1, so it's quite a, it's quite a high pressure gig, really. But I'm not really shitting it yet. <laughs> I'll wait till about five minutes before I go on. Dear boys, dear boys, dear boys. I just met uh, Sasha. Uh, he seems to be uh, a very uh, congenial guy, very nice. Um, he uh, already thanked us for uh, putting in uh, a lot of time and effort. Usually at the end of, it, of, of the tour, you know, you get all the uh, kudos and stuff, but he's already started. Seems like a very nice guy. I haven't met uh, uh, John yet, so who knows? I haven't met anybody yet, really. I'm tour manager for the artist for the next two months on the Delta Heavy Tour. And as far as my roles go, I'm learning them as we go. At the end of the night, we'll load out. The loadout will take anywhere between uh, two to four hours. And we have to go to the next gig because we have to load that in. And it could take anywhere between uh, five and eight hours to load the next one in. In and out. That's basically what we're looking for, is just to get in and out. Yeah. And uh, so we may have to do a little pushing. Hey, I've got that. Well, they, I mean, they don't like each other now, yeah. Sasha and John are like, you know, it's, there's rivalry there, there's all sorts of skeletons in the closet. I'll guarantee, I'll say this now, and I'm not just doing it for sales of this video, those two will hate each other, the tour will be a shambles by the end of it. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Everybody, 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 everybody
One of the things that I found most interesting is the fact that Sasha and Diegweed are finally playing in an arena. To be able to book an arena is really difficult for even any type of band. But for a DJ, I think it represents really the beginning of a domino effect where obstacles are starting to be knocked out of the way, where uh, commercial aspects, people are wanting to sponsor these events, people are wanting to be affiliated with these events. So I wanted to specifically come to the Sasha and Digweed event to be able to document, here, here they are. It's hanging on the fringes of mainstream America and it's really starting to creep in. My advice to Sasha, to you Sasha, over the next two months is to take as many drugs as possible. Get off your nut. It's the only way, the only, sometimes the only way forward is backwards. The DJ culture has gotten used to uh, living a very sort of um, jet set lifestyle around the world. And yet Sasha and John's commitment to the music and bringing it to people is one that has not diminished and actually has increased yet they are ready to, in some ways, go to the next level as individual artists and be a part of introducing a genre of music to parts of America outside the big cities. And in many ways, this tour and everything about Delta Heavy is a risk. America is a place where they like things that they've been introduced to and have had messages sent to them over and over and over and over again. I should say piss artist. My name is Sweetie Shigo. It's the Winter Music Conference 2002, and the Delta Heavy Tour is just premiering, just started Saturday. Welcome to America, welcome to Miami. How's it going for you guys, and how was the first night? It's fantastic. I think that the reason that uh, Sasha and John Digweed are so popular here is because they put on phenomenal quality shows. They always give the audience what they expect, but I think a lot more. They've been coming here steadily for a long time. Uh, they've both been, you know, especially John Digwood's been putting out lots of mixed CDs. Sasha has certainly had his uh, amount of uh, CDs here as well. I think what they did at Twilo was uh, very, very important, and it was something that people were talking about all over America, people all over America traveling to New York to see that. And once that ended, I think, you know, we were longing for them to come. But uh, to be able to see Jimmy Van M, Sasha and John Digweed all together with one great production behind them is going to be a real treat for us here in America. Until I get on that bus and really kind of get into that mode, I think I'm really going to start to realise what, you know, what I've let myself in for. The problem with America is that they don't know how to make a proper cup of tea over here. <laughs> they really don't. It's a nightmare. I, sh I, was, I should have gone to the supermarket in England and bought my own tea bags. But... Everywhere you go, you get yellow lips and tea bags, and they're absolutely horrible. So I don't even bother drinking tea when I'm in America. So I'll miss that. I'll miss Marmite on toast, and I'll miss um, EastEnders on Sunday. I spoke to Nick Warren, he's, he's done it before, and he says that sleeping on the bus is no problem at all, but other people have a very different... We didn't have you on the bus, though, did we? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> exactly. I'll be unplugging that hard drive. Uh, John, where, where have the styluses gone? <laughs> they keep disappearing. <laughs> Round about bedtime. <laughs> Outside this fucking enormous boat, uh, about to go on our boat party. Um, everyone's pretty frazzled from last night. Not me, I slept. It's got to be a first in Miami. Um, just loads of losers here, basically, <laughs> pulling faces at me. Yeah, the boat party starts at five, goes on till nine o'clock. Basically, go out to see Nick Warren's playing, Jimmy Van M, Sasha, and myself. And it's just a bit of a fun, fun time for the next four hours. It's going to be great, I'm going to play my new records with this exclusive little group of people and um, I'm really excited about it. All my mates are in, so that's important. They have this special ability to create an atmosphere which is so totally original. There's only a DJs that I know who really have pissed me off when I go and see them because well, I'm hearing stuff I know but they're, they're playing it in such a way that, that they just sound amazing. It's funny because I did a big tour like this with Massive Attack maybe in 1994 and living on a bus uh, smelling people's socks every morning and it's tough it's really tough you are normally a DJ at, at the weekends and this is going to be every single night and so and so your body clock is completely thrown it's completely fucked up this is Sean Cusack DJ extraordinaire from New York quality producer any words you'd like to say things are more like they are now than they've ever been before <laughs> and on that note I'm turning this off because I want to get drunk <laughs> Like loosened up now. This is the last time we're going to see Sasha and John for I think two months. So it's going to be really interesting. See you later. See you in San Fran. Amazing. I got to play most of my new album, which I've worked so hard on. And certain, he's, he's cer finished it. Finished it. <laughs> certain tracks that I thought I couldn't even play out um, went went down so well, and um, I'm absolutely buzzing my knackers off. So uh, we're off for a quiet night in about eight bars. A few strip joints.
really nervous about like you know crossing boundaries of personal space and you know we're all gonna be cramped in this bus and there's not been one episode that I can think of where somebody's like you know barked at the other one and like you know close the door or leave me alone or anything like that no no behavior that you know you don't know because you never know until you set out on something like that. As soon as we got on the bus we got a spinal tap which, is, which put us definitely in, in the right right frame of mind. Well, yeah, the crew, the crew's cool. We've got, uh, yeah, we've got some characters there. Chris, the driver of the other bus, is an absolute nutter. <laughs> he's, uh, he's just full of, full of stories, and uh, he, he, he had a great time in Vegas. I think he, off 120 bucks or something, he won $27,000 before dinner one night, and they, they put him up in a high rollers suite for two days, hoping that he'd go back to the casino and lose it all, but he stashed it. Um, Mike, actually, Mike D, who's the lion guy from Swilo, he, he won. I think he won 11,000. So they had they had a great time in Vegas. The guy's really been looking after the whole. He's kind of the daddy of the whole the whole crew. He's been looking after us all. Is Kenny, you know, the big guy with the tattoos. He's fantastic. He's just been like taking care of us the whole the whole time. Um, you know, the first night in Miami was just amazing. There's not one production problem, and I think that. I think that that's a testament to the amount of work and the, the professionalism of the guys that we've that we've been on the tour with. I mean, usually you just end up with a DJ that's just in the middle of the stage and there's just all this open space and it all just looks a bit, just a bit naff really. And I think the fact that, you know, you've got this whole area that's kind of, you know, screens and the statues and the lights and the sort of TVs and it gives you a focal point rather than just looking at this big open stage with a trestle table and a couple of decks on it. So we were talking about, you know, doing this tour and presenting ourselves and in a much more sort of visual way. And, I, you know, it was kind of, we are a bit worried, like, well, how, how are we going to do this? It was after a long weekend we decided to go see a, go see, go see a movie. We had no idea what we were going to go see. We just, you know, we had one of those theaters around the corner which just played 40 movies at the same time. And, and then we just went in, there was a new Brad Pitt film. Uh, John and I went to see the movie Seven, and we didn't, hadn't seen any previews about it or anything like that. I didn't know what it was about and stuff. We just went into the pictures one day in Orlando with Jimmy, actually. And uh, this movie came on, and the opening title sequences, just I remember them really blowing me away. It was so impactful, especially in the frame of mind that we were, you know, just really not knowing what to expect. Our agent in, our, in LA, UTA, just, uh, we, I called them up, and they were like, yeah, we know who did that. And within two weeks, they presented us with about 15 different... Um, visual identities for myself and John ranging from uh, the tribal imagery that we that we ended up going with because it seems to really tie in with the, with the music that we were playing and stuff. I really like it when the, the little tribal images start marching yeah. towards the screen. Cool. It's just so tripped out and then it's sort of got this fire behind it. It's just it's very intense. It's very, it's very cool, very trippy. Defender always gets a cheer as well when that comes on. that tribal theme basically um, it kind of really relates to you know Delta Heavy and the concept and the music and everything within sort of what's going on I believe now so it's sort of chapter one within we'll see how many chapters you know I think also Johnny the guy that's been working the visuals I mean it's just one thing having great visuals but it's having someone that understands how to make them flow within the music to make them have the best impact. I guess my official title here is VJ, or sometimes video designer. Essentially, I do exactly what John and Sasha do with sound, said I do it with visuals. You know, I guess here I'm a little bit more in the back seat to the DJs, and I'm used to kind of being the star. So he said. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him he's not doing the next tour. <laughs> What I like about it is that it really has a very uh, visceral, dark, um, film-like quality. It's very cinematic. What we've tried to do is provide a, some kind of narrative experience, something that really um, builds on 
Uh, well, it's just more than eye candy. That's, that's the best way to put it. Yeah, he's mixing the, the visuals the same way we're mixing music. He has all these DVDs, and he's actually mixing little elements in off, off each DVD. So it's kind of like he's, you know, he's piecing it together as the night builds up. And you know, there's just different intensities of visuals and stuff for the real peak of the night. That's quite full on and stuff for early on in the night. That's quite spaced out and abstract. And he, you know, he, fo he basically follows the the intensity of the music, which is really cool. No, I think, it's, I think it's all positive, it's all really positive and to see it going off in places like Rochester and Albuquerque and Albany is, is a really a really positive sign. They're, they've been the gigs that surprised me the most, you know, I thought we'd be playing to some really flat crowds that wouldn't understand the music and stuff and it'd be really hard, but you know, a lot of those smaller places it's just been, it's really gone off, so that's been exciting. Great. Minneapolis was fantastic. Yeah, it was Prince's old old club. Atlanta last Tuesday. That was mental. Unbelievable. Tuesday night, two and a half thousand people. The place just going nuts. No one would leave. Atlanta on Tuesday was great, Minneapolis was great, and uh, there were there were definitely a couple that really stood out in the fact that at the end of the night no one would leave. The Minneapolis gig out to actually we plug the sound system in and play one more. You know, just gigs like that where it's just you know you've got a Tuesday night or a Sunday night and most unbelievable crowd reaction ever.
the big cities, you can you can get you know you can get good food, but a lot of the time it's two o'clock in the morning. You kind of have to do, make do with what you can grab. And, We've had a couple of nights where we've had problems with the sound and we've both been tired. There was a there was a production problem in Seattle where the decks just kept feeding back and you know I lost my rag a little bit with the sound guys and I had to apologize the next day. Well a seven a seven forty seven's at one thirty. So I mean we we could hurt somebody in a in a room this small with MPA. Right. But we'll get we'll get it back. Happy. As soon as as soon as you go up there, I mean I'll just Hobie and I will open it up. Now we did the complete opposite to the monitors. You said that you thought that you were cranking too much on the monitor. No, I was talking about the games on the channels. Man. Okay. Exactly yeah, but didn't you say that you thought the monitor went up to like three o'clock and you didn't like yeah. that? You want to keep that? So we opened the monitors wide open. Okay. So, I mean, it's it's wide open. So you get up there around ten o'clock on that, That's and you're gonna be feeling it. Right. So all right, then we'll open the games on all the channels too. Okay. Cool. Each day there's a new set of obstacles. Um, you know, sometimes, a lot, a lot of the times, it's venue related. Uh, we get to the venue and you know, we have spatial constraints and you can't bring in all the equipment that we have, so you have to pick and choose what can go where. I don't recall the name of the city, but it's a suburb of Chicago. And apparently the, the mayor has been in, in power or in office for like 53 years. His son is the chief of police and his other son is the chief of uh, the fire. And that's the town that they were very, very, very poignant about if we were one minute over, they were going to impose a ten or fifteen thousand dollar fine. So, for obvious reasons, we were watching our clocks very closely that evening. They didn't create the crack house law for no reason. I mean, it's definitely there because you know they frown upon it pretty hard. The fact that it you know it does end at two o'clock for most of the shows, I think it became really helpful because not only did the police you look more favorably upon it because of that uh, I think it also in terms of a broadening the audience it was very helpful that way it all kind of works hand in hand you know it becomes a little bit more responsible at that point strength of this whole project really comes from, you know, your original question you asked, you know, why them? You know, uh, why did you pick Sasha and John? I mean, aside from the fact that these guys are immensely talented, I think it's sort of our teamwork working together that really works. Jimmy's done just the am most amazing thing, pulling this thing together. I mean, his whole concept of taking this thing on the road, making it happen. I mean, all the stuff behind the scenes. Uh, and the fact that when he DJs as well, he does the most amazing warm-up sets. Quite different than what I do when I go out and play on my own. You know, I play you know, definitely a little bit more up-tempo. But this is sort of the part of the night where you really have to build it up and kind of create a lot of tension and really kind of hold it back uh, in order for, for these guys to go on.
Sparrow, I met I met Sparrow the first night that I ever DJed at the Hacienda in 1989. It was in an orange jumpsuit, NASA jumpsuit. <laughs> Absolute mad raver. And um, yeah, we ended up moving into a house together in Manchester, which was just absolute party house. And there, yeah, he's just been, you know, he's just been one of my best mates for the last sort of, you know, 12, 13 years. I mean, obviously, you know, throughout the years, I've, you know, I had loads of money off Sasha. I'm buzzing off him, and uh, he, I've, uh, I've had a life of luxury, and I'm happy with it. Yeah, he's just an absolute nutbag. Keeps everyone always entertained. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, I'd like to see it at various stages. I'd like to see, it, uh, like do it at quarters if I could, if possible. You know, I'd like to be there for as many as possible, but physically I'm not going to be able to because uh, I'll probably lose the plot. I was up for him coming on the bus, but John was like, no fucking way. <laughs> And Dick, we roll. I had to come and see you guys. Um, it's just you're just this way above everybody else. I don't I don't get it. I, I don't understand it, but it's just phenomenal. <laughs> um, the night was incredible. The music was incredible. <laughs> Words really don't explain the energy and just the feeling of everybody together, the floor moving, and people just feeling the music. So it's something else. Because we're dealing with this huge company, Clear Channel, uh, to do this tour. They were basically people that guaranteed the whole tour, put the money up for it and stuff. Um, we had to sign this uh, very scary document, <laughs> which basically said if I'm if I if I missed a gig because I went missing in action or something like that, for any other reason apart from you know a legitimate medical reason or, or an act of God or whatever, that um, basically I'm liable for 150 grand a show. <laughs> so that was a that was definitely a, a uh, an incentive not to go to too many after parties. <laughs> I think they've had you know they've they've probably had their fair share of of rock stars bailing out on gigs and I'm sure it's pretty standard right now but you know my reputation might well have preceded me. <laughs> One of us is quite used to missing gigs. Not me. <laughs> Normally we're very late getting on the bus and with respect to our planned departure times and it just has to not matter. So if all you've got to do is focus on getting there on time, how come you can't get there on time? I'm not late for the gigs, man. I'm never late for the gigs. Have I? Have I been late for any of the gigs? I don't think I have. Borderline. <laughs> John's frequent, I mean, almost always more punctual or you know, closer to departure time than Sasha is. Sasha's, I think the earliest he's been is 50 minutes late. Yeah, you, can, you learn to manage it, you know? You start playing little tricks with him and telling him to be there 15 minutes early, so... <laughs> Until he's on to it and counteracts it with a 30 minute late arrival. <laughs> they just started confusing me by everyone to tell me a different time when the bus was leaving, so I basically just sit in bed until someone actually come and got me. <laughs> it's a little confusing. Uh, I heard at one point that it was gonna be a 10 a.m. departure, so I came down and started all the engines and began to think, get things going and it's now seven minutes after noon and we've not seen John or Sasha or Tim as a matter of fact yet so uh, what time we'll actually get away is still an unknown quantity. The fact that John and I are here together, we definitely, it definitely helps, you know, we pull each other through it, you know, it's not, if the whole tour was on, on one of our shoulders, I think it, we'd probably have to behave, you know, ten times more carefully than we probably have done on this tour. I've had quite a lot of fun. It's definitely a good way to do it, rather than the airports, you know, it's so much better, you finish the gig, you get on here, you travel, you wake up at the next city, 
check into the hotel. And I'm not dealing with security at the airports. It makes things a lot less stressful. And that first sort of couple of weeks, you know, that the bottles of vodka would disappear very quickly, but then as the tour went on, you'd find at the end of the night it'd still be like a lot, most of the alcohol left, left over. The bus came out to be a little bit of a surprise for me, actually. I mean, I thought it was going to be a lot more like just really crazy stuff, and it wasn't not like that at all. I mean, it's, you, know, you just end up hanging out watching DVDs, and it's, it's pretty quiet, actually. I mean, you, you get after you get home from the gig, you jump in, you know, you're coughing really, <laughs> and uh, you just uh, you crash out. Nightmare. It's uh, it's tough, man. Uh, spending a couple days cooped up on the bus is uh, that's really rough. That's uh, it's pretty hard, you know. It's it's kind of hard on your psyche a little bit because you you're feeling you know trapped and, and contained, and uh, it's a little bit tough. So to kind of get on the video games or uh, you know get into a book or something and, and, and try to get, make that time go by, but uh, it's tough. Yeah, I think we got stiffed on the bus, man. The cruise bus is really cool. Yeah, smooth as a baby's <laughs> bottle. Like, like, it, like it, riding horseback. It, like, <laughs> it, it, come the, it come the rookies. We'll stick them on the wonky bus. I'm the audio in, one of the audio engineers for Sasha and John, and uh, we are we are actually going out for dinner. This this situation right here, just with the, them taking us out and showing us a good time, this is a rare rare thing. It's definitely been a learning experience. Got a new extended family. <laughs> I'm definitely happy with it. I think everyone's happy with what I've been doing, so it's all around, two thumbs up, ready to do it again. Where are you from, Dan? Canada. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, are you, what are you doing on the tour? Uh, I, I, I barely sleep. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I, I get in, I get in the way of the pack every night. <laughs> It'll kick doors open here for us, and it's just a small town in Texas. And I mean, you can tell from the crowds that are here that this is what people love. This was the live music capital of the world. Now it's moved. It's honestly moved. These these kids are technology-based kids. They want to hear something new and progressive. They want to hear something electronic. I love Sasha and John. That's the only reason I'm here. They're, they're amazing. Oh my God. I love them. Have you seen them before? No, I've never seen them. But if I get to meet them tonight, though. One of the most exhilarating things. It was just like, you know, just the fact that you're just floating was just the weirdest sensation ever. And that's why I went back out again. I was like, <laughs> this is great. And Kenny was like, get back, get back. He was like, actually quite worried about me being out there because he, you know, he said I could have just gone right to the back of the club. For some reason, my head turns to the left. 
and all of a sudden, I see John Digweed floating by on a bunch of people. <laughs> it looked like something out of South Park, like the little head, little puppet head going by. So I rushed around the front of the stage, and thank God the people gave him back, and uh, grabbed him, and I told him, get over here, are you insane? <laughs> and then he tells me he likes it. <laughs> It's not like an event. I, I don't call it really like an event because no one knows when it changes. You know, it's like a, it's just like an ongoing thing. You know, people get up and clap. You know, the beat goes down, the beat goes up. The music was excellent. I've waited for six years to see these two men together, and now I can die happy. I accidentally tuned in to uh, the radio station, 93.3, and it was on a Sunday night, and it was the two hours when they were they had a special DJ and mixing some music and it was so good and I was just like yes they're playing our kind of music they're playing our kind of music I mean, on the was, radio I can't believe it eventually we were going to have to see Sasha and Digweed live anyway but when it turned up in Austin four and a half hours away it popped down hey uh, uh, we're gonna make it tonight and uh, it's, been, it's, it's tremendous <laughs> Holy oh, shit. Oh my Twice. god, look at that. Oh, that. Is that a red? It's a fucking mobile disc out in the road. I'm not gonna lie, I'm absolutely fucked right now, you know. And um, I'm really looking forward to two weeks off at home. Dallas, Texas, at the Bronco Bowl. Bronco Bowl. Bronco Bowl. Bronco Bowl. Pre-sales are like at 25 uh, and selling today, so probably another five or six today. Another four or five at the door tonight. 35, 3,600. We're taking a bet. As, you know, I was telling him yesterday, if you look at three shows within a four hour driving period, I mean, that's playing for 8,500 people within four hours. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. awesome. You know, normally it's Houston or Dallas, you don't get all three. Playing in America is just, you know, it's definitely one of the best places in the world at the moment, just because the enthusiasm that comes through is, you know, it's just how England used to be. I hate using that word how, how it used to be, but, you know, there's just that genuine, you know, you, you, just by walking down the queue, you know, the place just goes nuts.
only been a couple of yellow cards throughout the whole eight weeks, which is, uh, you know, really good. Usually we're like awarding ourselves if one of us fucks up, but, uh, you, know, it's been, you know, it's been one of those just like, actually, no one's actually made a mistake yet. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, it's slash and dig weed rock, man. At least they rave, right? So rave on, dude. and you know what a great place to end the tour in New Orleans at the House of Blues. I think we definitely achieved you know uh, really heightening the experience going into club you know I think it was tremendously successful that way I think you know the person who was going to the club who used to spend forty dollars they go in and spend forty dollars they got all these visuals it all relates it's the beginning of a story it's something compelling it's something interesting you know and it will develop there's something here in America with the scene, the way that it is, and with kind of what John, the, the crowd following that John and I have built up over here over the last sort of 10 years, you know, this, I think it's still in its infancy. Yeah. 